Hey everybody, hope you're having a great day. I am Dr. Brad Dieter and I am here with Eat to Perform. For those of you who are new to the channel, make sure that you go ahead and click the subscribe button and click the little notification button so you get every video when it first comes out. So today we're going to be doing a little bit of a question and answer. Um, I do these a lot online, usually in written form. Um, so people can save answers and stuff, but I wanted to do a video today um, to talk through a lot of the more nuanced questions that take me forever to type out. So I have a list of questions, I'm going to read them, um, and then we're going to dive into some of the answers. So one of the first questions that we have is from Jen, and her question is, how can you still be gaining weight even in a calorie deficit? This is currently happening to me and three or four other ladies in the gym. So there's a short answer and there's a long answer. I'll give you the short answer. You can't be gaining body fat percentage and body weight outside of some hydration um, you know, issues, whether you are dehydrated or hydrated or whatever, in a calorie deficit, right? You just you can never defy the second law of thermodynamics. Now, what they she's probably saying, and this is really what's probably happening, is she's saying, you know. I've been dieting for a while, or I've started dieting, or I've reduced my food intake, and I haven't lost weight, or I'm gaining weight. So there's a few reasons why these types of things can happen. You know, one is you've changed the foods that you're eating, um, you're switching to a more whole food diet, and you think you're consuming less calories than you were before, uh, but you're consuming more calories. So your weight's going up because you're consuming more calories. Now this happens a lot where people don't track their food intake and they switch from one type of diet to the next where they think they're in a calorie deficit but they're probably eating more fats than they think they are, right? They're not measuring correctly or they're just consuming more calories than they think they are. That's one option. Another possible answer is when people start to reduce their calorie intake, one of the things we know happens is their non-exercise activity really decreases, right? So people's just daily free living energy expenditure of walking around, fidgeting, um, just moving, being active, taking walks, that kind of stuff, drastically decreases, right? So a lot of people will see big decreases in non-exercise activity thermogenesis. And that NEAT, that non-exercise activity thermogenesis, is actually one of the biggest contributors to your total daily calorie expenditure. So maybe you're going to the gym still, but you've started to pull back on other things, right? You're just not as energetic. You don't want to go on walks. You're sitting a lot more. You know, you're not taking the stairs, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> Some other things could be that your sleep is decreasing. So you're not as active because you're not eating as much, right? We know dieting does decrease sleep quality for a lot of people. You could have decreases in some of your hormones, right? If you've been dieting for a long time or you started a diet 12 weeks ago and now you're getting really low calorie intake, you could be downregulating some of your thyroid hormones. <clears throat> so you're gaining weight not because, not due to being in a deficit, you're actually probably having some of these other adjustments going on while you're eating less food. That's actually causing your, you know, your calorie intakes decreased, but your calorie expenditure is decreased more than your intake is decreased. And this is actually very common, right? We do see this a lot, especially in clinical practice. So hopefully that answers your question. I'm just gonna have a drink of my coffee here and read the next one. Um, how do you get that last pound off in the last week of fat loss? I may or may not be referring to myself. So there's a few answers here, and, and the first one is, how meaningful is that last pound, right? Let's say you're sitting at, you know, 200 pounds and you want to hit 199. Mentally, that's a big hurdle for you, right? But in the grand scheme of things, how important is it to really go after that one pound in the, the bigger picture, in the larger context of things? Um, I think a lot of people will try to do a lot to get that extra pound when the sacrifices they make may not be worth it. Now, if you have to make weight for a weightlifting competition or for a jujitsu competition or something like that, then there are things that you can do, right? You can water manipulate. You can restrict carbohydrates for several days just to get that extra pound on the scale. You know, other things you can do that are more productive are you can go on longer walks. You can be more active. You can increase your calorie expenditure. Um, and those are more beneficial ways than really trying to cut back that, you know, extra calories for that last pound, right? If you're already eating 
1200 calories a day and your weight staying stable, the answer to that last pound is not going to 700 calories a day, right? That's, that's not a long-term solution. It's probably also not a very good short-term solution. Um, so, so that's really how we think about it. Here's a great question. This is from Danielle. Um, she said, coming off a very low calorie deficit and low carb, about 800 calories to 1,000 calories a day for six and a half months, that's, that's pretty big calorie restriction. Um, and I'm trying to repair my metabolism. Do I go right up to maintenance calories and regular carbs, or do you recommend slowly going up week by week? So the first thing is, you never destroy your metabolism. Um, your metabolism adapts to what you give it, just like your muscle tissue adapts to what you give it, right? If you were to, you know, lift weights, bodybuild for 12 years, and all of a sudden you stopped, your muscles are going to atrophy, just because the signals you give your body, it will adapt to it. The same thing with your metabolism. As you eat less and less food and you operate on a lower and lower amount of energy, your body is going to downregulate some of your metabolic processes and you will expend less calories per day, whether it's through meat, whether it's through hormones, um, whether it's through altering sleep patterns, a whole lot of different things like we just talked about earlier. Now, there's two different schools of thought um, typically when we talk about what we'll call reversing out of calorie restriction, or basically just your metabolism is downregulated for one of these various reasons. How do we bring you back to a normal state? Um, there's two ways to do it. Really, fundamentally, there's two ways. The first way is you kind of add 50, 100 calories every week, and you kind of try to keep your body weight stable, and you slowly bring it up. And if this lady needs to get to 2,500 calories um, to be a highly healthy, active individual, um, you know, that will take anywhere from 20 to 25 weeks or four to six months. Now, in that case, you're probably going to keep body weight within two to four pounds over that period, um, but it's going to take you four to six months with that type of math to get back to a normal life. Now, the other, op the other option is you just go, I am going to get back to normal function as fast as possible and I'll deal with a few pounds that come along the way and I can get back to my normal life fairly quickly. And so in a lot of cases, that's the better solution, right? You know that when you start consuming, if you go from consuming 40 grams of carbohydrates per day to 250 grams of carbohydrates per day, you're going to initially gain a few pounds of water weight because your muscles are going to be dehydrated because carbohydrates, water, hydrate, hold of it in your muscle. And then when you add carbohydrates back in, you're increasing your muscle carbohydrate stores and you gain a few pounds of water weight that's just in your muscle tissue, right? It's just like when you fill your gas up, um, your gas tank up in your car, you're adding fuel to the car, but you're not making the car any fatter, right? You're just adding liquid to it. Um, and then you may also gain two to three pounds of body fat along with that rapid increase in calorie intake but two to three pounds of body fat distributed through most of your body is not going to noticeably change your body composition uh, a whole lot. And in some cases, you may look a little bit better because your muscles are hydrated, so your muscles look full. Um, it's very similar to when you see people who are dieting down for, for shows. Um, a few days before their show, they don't look that great. They look very dehydrated. Their muscles look very small, but then they load with carbohydrates and salt. Um, and then do some other water manipulation and they maximize the intramuscular water and they look much fuller. So in many cases, it makes a lot more sense to, you know, over a span of two to four weeks, increase your intake pretty rapidly and realize there's gonna be a few pounds that come with it. Most of that will be water, some of that will be body fat, but then you'll have the ability to, you know, you won't have any issues, you won't have as many issues with some hormonal things, you'll be able to sleep better, you'll be able to train better. Um, and your body will adapt much more quickly. So those are the two routes, and we are big believers in the second route probably being the better answer long-term for most people. Um, fiber, what's a good range? The recommendations for fiber are 12 to 15 grams per thousand calories a day. So that, that usually turns out to be about 25 to 35 grams of fiber a day for women and men, respectively. Um, obviously, there's some wiggle room in there. You can go up a little bit. You can go down a little bit. But those are the actual guidelines. Um, let's see. 
The next question is, um, I'm newly coming off of the keto diet and I'm coming back to eat to perform. All the keto literature says eat as few meals a day as you can to minimize blood glucose and insulin spikes. If we're aiming ultimately for fat loss, how important is it to not snack all at all throughout the day to get those times of lower blood glucose? And with that, what about intermittent fasting or time-restricted eating? So this question kind of smuggles in a lot of things and assumptions that aren't true. Um, so the first thing is, Eating as few meals as you can to minimize blood glucose and insulin spikes have virtually no bearing on weight loss. We know that. We have studied that to death in the scientific literature. We've looked at meal timing. We've looked at meal frequency. We've looked at glycemic index. We've looked at insulin loads of foods. And we've looked at fasting levels of insulin, fasting levels of blood glucose. And none of those things predict weight loss, right? So you can lose weight independent of all of those things. Those don't really dictate anything. Um, in terms of weight loss over the long term and weight loss over the short term. There's no reason to change anything that you do based on those ideas. Now, for some people who have glucose issues, does it make sense to minimize blood glucose spikes and insulin spikes? Absolutely. Those people are typically on medications to manage that. So that's a much different conversation. But for most people, weight loss, that's not even, it's kind of a non-starter. It doesn't really make any sense to suppose that um, but I do understand why that's out there and why people are talking about that. So snacking. You can snack throughout the day if it fits within your total calories and your total macronutrient ratio. Um, we do know that macronutrient ratio is not a huge determiner of fat loss. But when it comes to things like exercise efficiency, exercise capacity, um, fullness, satiety, then those things start to matter. So if you can snack um, within those parameters... Snacking doesn't really appear to have any big influence on fat loss. Now where it can come into play is if snacking leads you to fall outside of your plan, because um, most people's snacking behaviors are not you know, pre-planned, they're not thought out, they're typically extra calories on top of what they're supposed to eat in a given day. All right, um, so another question is, a lot of our plans that eat to perform fluctuate fats and carbohydrates throughout the week, um, but not protein. So there's a few reasons for this. One is we know that your body and your physiology and your weight loss and fat loss results really are the net cumulative effect of weeks, months, and years over time. Um, protein we keep constant because one, we can use it as an anchor for people. Um, two is most people can't really do well eating 100 grams of protein on a Monday and 300 grams of protein on a Friday to get the net balance over a week, right? So we just, we just know that that's one of the hardest nutrients for people to get and hit consistently. So if we can keep that stable throughout the week and you can hit your daily intakes, um, that's much better than trying to vary protein throughout the week. We do vary fats and carbohydrates um, for a few pragmatic reasons and a few scientific reasons. Pragmatically is people like to have variety in their food um, and people like to have days where they can have a few more carbohydrates and like to have days where they can have a few more fats. We know from the scientific literature that um, mechanistically low fat diets appear to be a little bit better at fat loss, actual body fat tissue fat loss um, over shorter and longer periods of time mechanistically than lower carbohydrate diets. Um, in practice, those, those differences are so small that it doesn't really matter. So we do like to have days where fat is a little bit lower um, for those reasons. Another reason is if you have a daily intake, if you're on a fat loss cycle and you have a daily intake of 1800 calories and you have high workload days, we want to be able to give you days where you can consume 250 grams of carbohydrates in a week so you can have you know good workout capacity you can have days where recovery is better you're not always eating lower carbohydrates so we can give you some benefit on some hormonal regulation um, and the same thing with fats right people don't want to eat low fat every single day so we build those things in for pragmatic reasons for some scientific reasons um, and then just some variety reasons all right so the last question we'll get to today and then we'll wrap it up i know we've been here for about 15 minutes thank you guys for sticking with me and thank you guys for dealing with my hand motions um, last question is from Tiffany. 
So Tiffany asked, I'm new to lifting, been athletic my whole life, but the goal in the past was endurance. Now I'm trying to build muscle. This may sound like an odd question, but how do I increase weight? For example, I can easily do 10 reps at 30 pounds, dumbbell shoulder press, but when I got up to 35 pounds, I can only get two to three reps. Do I keep reps low and sets high or mix up the weight for different sets to get reps in? I hope I'm asking this right. So you're asking a great question. So I'll start with one principle and then we'll kind of build from there. So you're talking about growing muscle, which is called muscle hypertrophy. And the main dictator of that is total volume, right? So reps times sets times weight appears to be the main driver of uh, muscle hypertrophy. So you can, in theory, just continue to increase volume by doing, you know, more sets, more reps, um, or you can add weight in. And for you, if you're struggling with, with weight, and if you can get 10 on one and two or three on another, you're probably going to benefit from short periods of strength-focused work, right? So maybe you go through a eight-week block of hypertrophy where you do your 10 reps at 30 pounds, Maybe as you progress to get more progressive overload, you go from three sets at 10 to four sets at 10 to five sets at 10, or you do 10 plus five plus five plus five, like myo rep style, or you do cluster sets or drop sets or some way to manipulate volume with that weight. Um, and then you take a break from uh, a volume hypertrophy training and you take six to eight weeks to work on strength, where you grab the 35s and you do five to six sets of two to three reps until you can do those and then you go to 40 pounds and then the next time you come back to a hypertrophy volume now you can do the 35s for sets of 10 and so that's a good way to cycle through right is periods of focusing on certain blocks will do a lot better for you long term than if you're just always trying to go you know high volume without any strength work if you're really struggling with strength work so Hope you guys enjoyed this. This is the first of a Q&A series that we will be doing. This will be in conjunction with um, a lot of the case studies that we're doing. And then we'll also be doing some more vlogs and some entertaining stuff here and there. Um, but really appreciate it. Make sure you guys go ahead and hit the subscribe button. Go for the notification. Maybe one of these days we'll just have a coffee talk. Um, and we really appreciate you guys hanging out. We'll talk to you later.